Max Tepper, welcome. So, thank you. Uh, so, Skin in the Game is the name of the podcast, and so I want to dive in a little bit into um, your passion for rock climbing and how you uh, structured your life in order to pursue your climbing goals and your passion, because um, it's complicated. Uh, there's tons of different ways to go about it. Uh, there's doctors, there's dirt bags, there's everywhere in between, computer engineers, guides, right, whatever, people that make motion. Yep. Um, so, uh, so uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, um, yeah, and yeah, we'll, we'll start there. Uh, so I would, in that spectrum, I'm somewhere in between a climbing guide, which means I work like I mean, different guys do different ways, but for me, it's like 100 to 150 days a year, depending on the year. And um, that, for me, works really well for climbing goals because it, one, gives me the other 200 some days to go rock climbing. Mm -hmm. And then also, like, guiding is like a pretty itinerant job. They can travel all over the country, like, to guide, usually in places with good rock climbing. So you can usually pair the two together to uh, facilitate a climbing trip and a work trip at the same time. Um, yeah, that's like pretty much it. I go rock climbing whenever I'm not guiding. Cool. <laughs> We're done here. Yeah, that was a like, uh, simple, simple question. How, how long ago did you start rock climbing? I started, I like first ever did it in 2003. Mm -hmm. uh, more like in a mountaineering context. There's a mountaineering club in my high school. But I didn't really like start taking it seriously or like actually like it at all until 2006. And then I was like, oh. I was really bad at it at the time. Like I could barely climb five nine. Uh, but I was like, oh, I'm gonna do this. I like this. So. Where did you like? Where was your first rock climb, and what what about it sparked that? Sparked what? that like? Because I think everybody has that. That right. Like, oh, I'm gonna do this forever. That's the funny thing though. Like I hated it. Like. Yeah. Oh. So there's this crag in Eugene where I grew up called the Columns, and it's mm -hmm. this like old basalt quarry, and it's like a great how to like crack climb crag, um, because it's super accessible, but it's like low angle, lots of easy stuff. Um, but like I was scared, I was bad at it, I was like, this is really hard. But basically, I was like obsessed with like alpine climbing. Mm -hmm. Not that I wasn't like doing that because I lived in Eugene, but I was like, I wanted to do that. Not that far away. Yeah. And so, like, in my mind, rock climbing was this thing that I had to be good at in order to alpine climb. Mm. And, like, did that, like, classic thing where I was like, if I could just climb 5'9", I could, like, climb all these routes. And then, yeah. like, I got better at climb 5'9", so I was like, I'll just climb 5'10". And then, like, at some point, I just became you know, like, rock climbing. Did you have, like, the Cascade Climbs book? Oh, yeah. Like, oh, I gotta, so, okay, I gotta get up that one, I gotta get up that yep. one. Yep, exactly. I had that in... When I, I grew up in Ohio, when I got that, <laughs> I was like, oh, shit, look at, look at this. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but you didn't. So you didn't like it at first. Yeah, I was bad at it. I was scared of it. Uh, but I was like inspired by what it looked like uh -huh. and like where it could bring it. Where yeah, like, I'd see photos. You know, that time it wasn't like Instagram or anything. There was barely yeah. the internet. I would get like climbing magazines. Yeah, like, I didn't even get climbing magazines because it was too cheap. I didn't get Alpinist. I was like obsessed with Alpinist like the first issues mm -hmm. um, when I was in college. But like, you know, you get like catalogs and the catalogs would have like photos in them. And yeah. I'd be like, yeah. oh, like that's, I'd see like a splitter of me, at, in you, for me if you got a pente or something. I'd be like, that is like the most beautiful thing ever. So, so the aesthetics kind of yeah, drew that was like the rock. That and like, that and then like, the uh the like tool based approach like I need to get good at this so I can do this other thing yeah oh like using climbing as a tool not like right. the gear that's involved yeah yeah, yeah. I was like you get, I did like on that. out on that part for yeah. sure it's like I feel like most you know college age dudes are like mm, boys yeah I think most people I don't know guys <laughs> in general are just yeah. like look at this cool stuff I need more <laughs> of those things um did you. At what point in climbing did you know that like guiding was a thing you could do as a living? I like, or did you want to, were you yeah, like, yeah. I want to guide no. first and then you figured out how to I make like, a living? At no point in my life was I like, I'm going to be a mountain guide. Mm -hmm. um, 
I was like tangentially aware that it, the career existed, mm -hmm. but it was, I had no clue like how you would go about doing that, nor did I like have you know, any like motivation to do so. Because mm -hmm. um, I didn't see myself as someone that would ever do that. Like, again, I was like pretty bad at climber and like yeah. inexperienced. Um, but let's see, so like in college, I took a nose course mm -hmm. and I was like, I basically like walked away from that because at that point in my life, I was like, didn't really have a degree picked out. I was just like going to college, just like my, uh, started my sophomore year. And I was like, oh, um, that seems cool. I want to work there. And then so I like spent the next like three years of my life like doing whatever I could to like, you know, build a resume for lack of a better word to like work for Nulls. And so then, you took the course and then you wanted to work there? Or yeah, yeah. I saw like the instructors that like taught the course to us and I was like, this job seems amazing. They get yeah. paid to be in the mountains. I want to do that. Um, so that was the way. That was like that was like the entrance uh -huh. to working in the outdoors. What kind of course was great? It was a semester in Wyoming. Okay. Uh, well, not just it was in the Rockies, so it was like Wyoming, Montana, um, and Utah. We did like thirty days of mostly backpacking, but ostensibly mountaineering in the winds, but it snowed because it was September. Um, so we didn't climb all that much. And then we went and did like a caving camp. We did like ten days in like the Wyoming Montana border, like caving, which well, was kind of cool. I'd never done that before. I was like, wow, this is sweet. What I realized is like, Knowles is way better for saying things you like, don't have any experience in. Yeah. Like I'd already done some climbing. I was like, this is kind of lame. Cacks are really heavy. We're not climbing at all. <laughs> uh, and then we did like a three week backpacking trip in Utah, like Canyonlands area, and then a two week uh, ski trip. Go cool. Wyoming. In that order? Yeah. Oh, because you started in September and then yeah, it was like thirty days long. December ski trip and then exactly. or something. Exactly. Cold. Yes, it was. It was very cold. Yeah. It was minus forty at one point. And Woo! It snowed a lot. <laughs> yeah. A lot of digging. A lot of digging. Did you ever work for Nulls? Yeah, I worked there for five years. Oh, so yeah. yeah, like in two thousand eight, while I was still in college, I took my instructor course and then worked seasonally, like summers for them, basically for five years before. Like at that point in my life, I like was like. Working for Knowles was like complicated because it was on one hand a really cool job that takes you to amazing places, but on the other hand you're like gone for months of the year mm -hmm. and like that kind of sucks. One, because you like can't, you know, connect with community and like family as much, but like if you're obsessed with rock climbing, which at that point in my life I was, you like can't train. I was still. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, so anyway, like I, when I saw the opportunity to become a guide, because um, one thing you do at Knowles for professional development is take an AMGA rock guide course. Mm. And so I did that and like the instructors there were like, you should do this. You're, you seem like you're good at it or you could be good at it. And so I kind of dipped my toe in and like basically the first days of guiding, I was like, oh, this is way better. Cool. Because like working for Knowles was cool because you were in the mountains and like you teach some climbing, but you also just like backpack a lot and like yeah. Teach like natural history, which is not terrible, but I like going climbing, and so like that wasn't a good fit for me. So like as soon as I was like teaching people to like actually just go climbing, like that part was way more fun. Did you, did you ever have the opportunity to like guide any of the Red Rock trips or? I did a Smith Rock camp, um, which was like yeah, all climbing, and it was good. But like it's there. There are some people that like built a career at Knowles where they mostly just did that stuff, but like that it's like a minority. Like at some point you gotta like go back and go walk around with like fifty pound backpack for a month. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So yeah. And just like if you were as a guy, your wages are way, way, way better. Mm -hmm. Double to triple what you make. Which is just like it's kinda of sweet to like that's one of the things I love about guiding is like you you're you know, you work a like relatively small amount of days, but you make a decent amount of money in those days. So you oh. don't have to work under the days as much. Did, was Knowles a good entry into the guiding is it like for sure you have you have you know days days under your belt yeah you, you work with groups in remote areas yeah you're like you're used to group management mm -hmm. yeah in remote context you're used to like talking to people it's like a big part of guiding is teaching mm -hmm. um you get really dialed in holes at just like living in the mountains which is because you're <laughs> like mm -hmm. most of the year um and then that's like a super solid like base for being a mountain guide like yeah. you need to be you need to be a good climber and you need to understand like how to manage the terrain and like you know 
the logistics of running a good trip, but you also need to like be personable, be able to talk to people. And like, mm-hmm. I was not, I was like super introverted. <laughs> like, Mills like was very helpful for me in like getting me like good at talking to people that I don't know. Do you find that I'm introverted as well, but if the situation is like mandatory that I'm in front of people, I kind of yeah. just embrace it, open yeah. up. Do you find that? To do you developed that or yeah you had that or? yeah yeah like it we, when I first ever like tried to start managing groups and like teaching people stuff about the outdoors like I was unless it was like a very narrow uh, band of skills or like topics that I was well versed and comfortable with mm-hmm. I was like pretty bad and just like not a particularly effective educator and just like you know, super quiet and like not effective at delivering the content. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was like a really valuable experience in like learning how to like basically like take something I don't really know anything about, distill what of it I'm trying to communicate to whoever I'm talking to and like how to communicate it. Yeah. yeah. They have some, Mills has some pretty good uh, tech, uh, instructor course as well mm-hmm. in the semester. They have some good, I'm sure it's <laughs> developed a ton by now. Uh, it's pretty different from what it looked like. They have some good uh, material on um, leadership and group dynamics and communication. For sure. And um, it'd be interesting to see what their material looks like now because when I was there, it was, I took the instructor course in 01, I think, and I took the semester in 97. Okay. And it was like a uh, cartoon. Right. It was cartoons with like a spiral binder. Yep, that was still there when I was there in 2008. It was good. I yeah, like, there was like good stuff in there. I'm sure like some of the content changed because mm-hmm. they would develop it year to year and tweak it. Um, but yeah, there was like the leadership instructor notebook or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when I work in kitchens, I would give that to people. Just Yeah, like, well that was the crazy thing. How do you communicate here? Like, you know, we've got like all these friends that work in medicine and you talk to them and they're like, so what do you guys do to like learn to talk to each other? And they're like, what? Yeah, <laughs> we don't do that. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, it's like very valuable. Like I, I feel like I, what I took away from that because like a lot of guides like look at knolls and they're like that's super sketchy. Like they shouldn't be doing that because they're you know guides think the only people that can teach climbing are guides. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know. Like my take home is that like any like sixteen year old should probably take a knolls course because they'll just yeah. like, learn how to like suffer a little bit. They'll learn a lot about themselves. They'll learn how to work with other people. You get to go through the whole. Well, the thing I found very interesting, especially I apply it still to this day, like 30 years, no, not 30, I was 10, <laughs> 20 years later, uh, is the the progression of group dynamics. So yeah. you have the honeymoon stage, and then at the end, everybody implodes because it just makes leaving easier. Right. The, what is it? The forming, yep. the arming, performing, and storming? Storming and performing, I think, gets switched, but yeah. Okay. And like, ideal, it, like they, I think it's, like, everything you said, and then after storming, I, ostensibly, you, like, learn to work with each other, and you, you can start to perform as a group and, like, accomplish things. Yeah. Um, and then there's, like, group death, which is when the yeah. group dissolves. Everybody's just like, fuck you! I'm out! <laughs> um, and I see that, I see that everywhere, whether it's a job and you have short-timers disease because you know you're about to leave, or, right. or like family get-togethers where you're there for three days or two days and, or four days or whatever and on the last day somebody's they don't want to leave subconsciously and so they're just like break it down and just right. so it makes it easy you know, i gotta go yeah it's like people that break up relationships by doing something terrible not because just because they don't know how to be like hey i don't want to be with you yeah yeah it's not good communication yeah yeah, yeah. which just turns out a really important part of being a human knowing how to talk to other humans it's hard <laughs> <laughs> i think sure. i think like this is good because uh i see at my shop i just see like two or three people and then you know it's very rare to sit down and talk with people right Especially like at a crowd, you kind of have like short chatter and talk shit a little bit about one thing. It's funny, like I really love the social elements of that, like when you go cracking, but it is a very superficial experience. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, 
it's funny because I feel like we, we, we pretend like we're like bonding when we're all out at the cliff or whatever, but like, and we are to some degree. Like, yeah. It's not like a, it's not like, yeah, we're not talking about things that like actually matter most of the time. We're like, yeah. about the hole that broke last week. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's weird because you do have like your blade partner, you do have that like very right. I think close relationship with. Yeah. And you know, each other group has that, but it doesn't always tra- it rarely transfers from like group to group to just like totally. jump straight into that it's like yeah nice yeah. weather that hole sucks <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. It's a hard cut. i couldn't do that route either <laughs> yeah but i don't even know it you know like i still suck at talking with people yeah it's, unless unless it's like uh it's very context specific yeah sometimes i'm just like blah, blah, blah. Sometimes i'm just like yeah yeah <laughs> and what are you supposed to do like i guess i guess this is what you do <laughs> if you were like a nice compassionate, if I was a nice compassionate person, you go to the crab and you're like, how's your family? <laughs> you're like, how's your, how's work? Oh, it's yeah. Like, I feel like on some good. level it'd be like unrealistic to expect that level of connection from that interaction. Um, but like, I feel like sometimes we pretend that we're getting like a deeper level of connection with like, like, oh, it's like, yeah, it's such a cool crew. And you're like, it is a lot of fun to be out there. And like, I'm like, I love the people like Community and Smith. I think it's super rad. They're wherever I'm climbing, usually I like the people. Um, but I think I'd be deluding myself if I was like telling myself that I was like deeply connected to everyone that's there. Yeah. And I think beyond that shared passion for the place. Yeah. And part of it is it is our recreation and it is our time for release and fun and totally. to like rejuvenate ourselves. And so we don't want to get into heavy you know it's a yeah. it's a place we can get away from the world and the problems yeah and yeah so probably having those dark deeper they don't have to be dark but deeper conversations would kind of take us out of that right maybe yeah for sure yeah mm-hmm. uh so wh- you kind of alluded to this um then you took Knowles instructor course, you worked five years. In retrospect, that was a net positive mm-hmm. for your gaining for gaining experience and knowledge for guiding. It's like but, a life experience. But you also said that the general guide, rock guiding community doesn't look favorably favorably upon that, or is it just a few drunk <laughs> Grumpers. Yeah, I think it's like a pretty safe generalization to assume that like, yeah, so like there's definitely oh, yeah. a lot of guides that have a similar track to myself and that they like had some interaction with Knowles or worked there for a long time and so don't necessarily see it as a bad thing. But there's definitely a, a culture within the guiding community of like, I'm the only one that knows what's going on. And mm-hmm. I think a, a, a byproduct of that is like a lot of guides who don't have any experience with Knowles, look at what Knowles is doing and they think they're like a bunch of like underqualified college students taking mm. everyone's kids out into the woods in this really dangerous way, which like my experience was that was not really the case. But yeah, I mean if you look at Knowles' track record of safety. Yeah, by volume for sure. Like they did they take a lot of people into the mountains and into the wilderness and like they've you know, they've had fatalities and they definitely had injuries and incidents, but like that was actually one thing I really appreciated, like starting at Knowles and going to the guide community. Like Knowles' institutional risk management is like vastly superior to anything I've encountered. Mm-hmm. Right? Just because guys don't like to talk about it. Well, they pretend like they like to talk about their mistakes and sometimes do, mm-hmm. but most of the time they do not publicly share the mistakes they make with each other or yeah. with anybody really. Anywhere from like the micro mistakes <laughs> to close calls to like. Yeah. Which is funny because there's this culture in guiding and you're like, oh, you're supposed to like learn from your mistakes and like. Share, share them with each other and like all that stuff but like when the rubber hits the road like a guy is not gonna like publicly declare to the world like hey I almost killed this guy today right you yeah know? but they should because that would like one help other guys learn from that mistake and help other climbers learn from that mistake is there like an anonymous reporting no that seems like that could be you super just helpful be perfect. <laughs> yeah <laughs> they are yeah. guys are perfect and like that's something like we've created here in Oregon at uh, the guide service I work for. With like a, um, basically a, a spreadsheet of like all of the near misses and incidents mm-hmm. we 
like experience and like down to like pretty minor things like you know someone will like like slip and like slide down like a 15 to 20 foot snow slope and a rest and like that can, that can become a near miss yeah. i think like yeah it's really valuable with that stuff to like not under report like more reporting is better because mm -hmm. you know just because the outcome is good doesn't mean it wasn't uh, a moment that you can learn from yeah definitely do you report like people that get like blisters no like, do you go that far down there no not so much more just like basically anytime the guide deemed and it's like a self-reporting tool like, so it's like a, you know, yeah and it's like it, it, so like what I mean by the self-reporting thing is like the guy's got to choose to disclose it to the company like we basically have like an internal email list sort of thing and like you know if I see like once I was guiding at Smith and doing Sky Ridge and like you know you, there's that like nook at the base of Asterisk Pass where you rope up and I was like oh I see now a relatively safe place to stand around it from an objective hazard perspective because like the ridge tilts far away from you and like it is also a ridge, so you can rock the shed to one side or the other. And we're like sitting there, we got back to our packs and we're like, you know, eating food or whatever before we hike out. And there were people on the route above us, and I was relatively unconcerned about them because they were all the geometry they just described. And a rock landed like a foot and a half away from us. And I was like, oh, dang, how did that happen? And so I like wrote this email, being like, hey, I had a miss near miss today. We almost got clogged by a rock. It was in a spot that I thought was just super safe, and just so everybody knows, it's like actually not that safe. And so that ends up in a spreadsheet, and then like a guy that's never guided a Smith before can look at that and see, mm -hmm. like, oh, that's an this important can't thing. Happen. This is the thing that can happen here. Because otherwise, I think, and this is what Knowles did really well, is they had like this institutional memory going on, because there's mm -hmm. such a big organization and had been around for so long that they like could communicate from one generation of old instructors to the next the hazards and the terrain that they were um, working in really well that might be otherwise overlooked. Um, and I think in guiding, that's often lost. How do they, with such a long history of guiding and what I assume is a long list of near misses or just incidents, how, how do they put that together in a way that's digestible instead of just being right. like, so there they all are. I mean, it's been like 10 years since I've worked there, so it's probably changed in some regard. Um, but when I worked there, there was like a website that was for multi employees, and you could log into risk, the risk management tab, and there was like a write up of every significant near miss. And their, their like granularity for near miss was lower, I think, just as a symptom of them being like a massive organization, where it's like TMG here, we have like 20 guys, so it's mm -hmm. relatively small. Um, but like, you know, there's just this list sort of by date of, I think it was date and maybe like discipline. So there was like the CPAC. No, I think it's just by date. Um, do, do like, and then so you, you click on it and be a PDF of the like formal analysis and write up that the school conducted of like kind of the after action. Do they categorize it like rock fall, oh, yeah. or tie it in so you could be like, that's the most, this is the one that happens the most. Cutting avocados happens like number five. To a certain degree, yeah. You could like, because yeah, like very early on, they would you know, describe you know, what influenced the incident from the near miss. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so Knowles isn't a bad thing. No. <laughs> cool. It's uh, definitely great. What was the first, outside of Knowles, when you started rock diving, what was what was your like entry into rock diving? I think a lot of people think it's right. It's pretty hard to get into. Did you right. go straight? You got a rock rock instructor course in while you worked for Knowles in yep. VA rock instructor. Exactly. And so <clears throat> single um, pitch instructor. Or no, I skipped that one. Okay. You know, went straight to the rock diving course just because Knowles kind of has this on their own like in house mm -hmm. SPI that they do. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like it is a hard thing to break into, and like honestly. Kind of what I tell like people that because a lot of people are like, how do you leave my guy? It seems sweet. Uh, there's basically two avenues of entry depending on where you live. Um, you can either work as an SPI and rock guide, and you have to kind of go to the place where there's work volume to do that. Because mm -hmm. like here, it's really hard to break in as an SPI. Like you can do it because Smith is getting busier and more popular. Mm -hmm. But like when I started working here, like it was there were you know two companies that would hire you and the company I worked for is not one of them. They, they were more like outline specific, but it generalized. 
Um, or you can, so you can do the SPI thing, or you can work in the mountains. And uh, I kind of started working in the mountains. Like I, I took the rock hike course and then ended up guiding on Mount Hood. At the time, like that was enough training to guide on Mount Hood and like guide in the mountains with TNG. It tra- changed it now, so you need an alpine guide course. And I did take my alpine guide course in pretty short order after starting to work. So that was part of the deal of my employment. It was like, I like literally already registered for the Alpine Bank course. And so they were like, cool, like we'll give you a couple days now and we can get back in like mid June and we'll give you more. So, and and then you worked for TMG, Alpine Guiding, and then were you able to take your Alpine customers and say, hey, you want to do some rock trips with me or? To a certain degree. Yeah, so the way, the way guiding has worked for me, and I think this is the way it's pretty common, is you work for a company or a series of companies through the year and in doing so, you kind of build a clientele for people that you take out and they like um, like climbing with you and they want to climb with you in other places and they're willing to like often have to pay a little bit more to do that mm-hmm. because then you know you ask them to like cover your costs or whatever to get to that place if they're not already there. Um, and then so like at this point, eh, for me, it's like probably 30 to 40% my return clients in a awesome. year. Yeah, it's sweet. It's pretty fun. Um, and then like you want to keep the flow going so you keep working with companies one because like I probably don't have enough return clients to like just work with them exclusively mm-hmm. but then also just like yeah you, you want to like have the like, as you know clients age out you want to like get more coming in so you keep working for like off the rack trips for companies oh. Oh. Okay. <laughs> what are you doing um so I start all the all the questions of so I gotta figure out how to do more <laughs> to use. <laughs> it's your own. Yeah. Uh, so there's like TMG. There's a couple more at Smith. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you have any? Do you have any uh, like pointers or recommendations in retrospect on how to if if you are you're somebody like uh-huh. rock climbing. Um, do you think there's minimum comp- ah. comp- hey, Simpson. Ah. <laughs> is there like minimum competencies people should be going for? Is AMGA uh, certification like the thing to do? Is there other routes to go? There's historically there have been more other routes. AMGA certification, not necessarily becoming fully certified, AMGA training mm-hmm. is definitely becoming like a standard. Like there are a lot of companies that it's not mandatory for you to have it, but if you have it, it just it makes it every way easier. Does the pay pay grade go up with that? Is typically it commensurate? Like it it does here. Mm-hmm. All the companies that I work at, it goes up um, based on your training, but that's not always the case. Some companies think the MGA is stupid and don't care if you have an MGA training. It's right. Right. It's training. Uh, in terms of like other like baseline skills, like like I was saying, like a lot of people that are climbers like want to be mountain guides because they think they get to go climbing all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and then there's this like I think because of that dynamic, there's this perception that guiding is actually like bad for your climbing. Mm-hmm. Like I, I feel like that's like a narrative you hear in the climbing community from time to time, um, or it's just like incompatible. And I think. What's going on there is there's a specific set of attributes you need to be a mountain or just be a guide in general. Like you, you need to be super patient because you're always almost going to be working with really slow people that are less experienced than you are that are you know in an environment that's unfamiliar to them. Uh, you need to like like being around people that, or you need to be able to be around people that you don't like. It's kind of like working in the service industry, right? Like you need to like it is the service industry, like you know, treat everybody like kindly with respect, even if you don't really like them that much. Um, and then, like, you need to be good at climbing or skiing or whatever it is you're taking people to go do. Uh, and I think a lot of people just they, they see that career path and they see guides out guiding on rock or in the mountains or whatever, and like, I'll be doing that. And it's like, yeah, you do that, it's great. But that's like, such a small facet of, of the career that like it, if that's the reason you're there you're gonna burn out in, in a season or two because one like 
it's like not the odds are that like the routes you're guiding are not all that interesting for you, which is a good thing because <laughs> otherwise, like like if the if the routes are interesting for you, it probably means they're kind of hard for you, and you shouldn't be guiding terrain that hard for you. And that's probably a whole different type of burnout if you're like <laughs> mentally stressed all the time. Oh god, right? I can't even imagine. And then I think the other thing that works well for me is like the the terrain. I, everyone's like, oh, do you like burn out on climbing because it's your job? And it's like. The climbing I do for fun and the climbing I do for work do not look anything like yeah, each yeah. other. Like climbing 5'8 in the road shoes and <laughs> projecting whatever are two completely different activities as far as Yeah. yeah. If you put them next to each other, it's like it would look like two different sports. <laughs> totally. Yeah, exactly. Ditto like mountain guiding, right? Like mountain guiding and like performance rock climbing or mm-hmm. like Do you think mountain guiding is a necessary part of uh, being a rock guide? Uh, either the skill and planning of it or the financial like cushion it provides? Not necessarily. Mm-hmm. It definitely makes it easier just because mm-hmm. that's where more options. There's, there's more work mm-hmm. and it, it pays better. People pay more to be scared in the mountains than they do on rocks. <laughs> yeah. How, but there's definitely like, people that have built careers like, you know, single pitch guiding in the southeast or the northeast or like just rock guiding in Vegas or Joshua Tree. Like, there's, yeah. there, there are lots of like exclusively rock guides out there. Mm-hmm. But there's just like so many mountains in the American West that like you can make a long way around money that you, you are open to that. Yeah. You walk up hood. I do. Every year. I do. Tens of times, hundred times. I don't count. It's probably not a hundred. I, I would year. Go, No, definitely not. Some people say twenty per year. I don't want to pay that close attention. Uh-huh. Uh, I bet it's somewhere between ten and twenty for me in a given year. I have a coworker. He's been here since two thousand and four, five, and I think he's done like four hundred summits. So it's it's like he counts every basically every weekend for the entire free stock. Oh no! So we it's it's a little different from that. So we start sometime in April, mm-hmm. and it starts like weekends in April. And then in May, it's like six days a week. We run three trips. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, and we're not climbing the mountain six days a week, but our trips are typically two-day trips. Like, you meet the clients in the morning, teach them how to walk on snow and ropes and stuff, and we climb that night, uh, and then into the next day. Uh, like, we meet at, like, one in the morning. We go climbing. Um, and you'll just do, like, that cycle three times a week. So it, it's, like, you may only climb put it 20 times but it's like 60 days of work yeah you like uh looking at my calendar for like may and june right now that i'm like look trying to see like days where i can go climbing for myself and i'm like I'm just gonna try to climb after work at smith mm-hmm. because and that's like one thing i like about hood is like often we get done working between 10 and noon and i can like drive down to smith and go rock yeah. climbing or to trout creek or whatever those are so it's just the intrinsic motivation within you that like yeah yeah because those are long days i mean they are and they aren't like an alpine guiding hood is actually one of the shortest days out there it's kind of great that's the other thing i love about it it's like it's 1 a.m to 2 p.m or not even some i mean if the weather's bad it's like 1 a.m to 1 30 a.m that's oh yeah it's just like awesome. yeah, no <laughs> i mean there it doesn't happen that often but there, we take a snowcat up the first like 2500 oh, vertical nice. feet which is nice to the top of the bus. Exactly. And like, there are literally days where you open the door of the snowcat and like, <laughs> snow comes in and the clients are like, no, we can ride the snowcat back down. At what point do you pull the plug? Uh, is it like, well, yeah, no, I'll so suffer with you guys. <laughs> hood's a funny one because you can, you can definitely climb into some storms up there because it's a relatively simple climb. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, like, depending on the storm, especially if it's like, frozen and not mm-hmm. raining and like I'm not worried about the, the mountain falling down on top of me as much mm-hmm. and the avalanche hazard is good uh I'm willing to like climb into the storm if the clients are like fit mm-hmm. and competent mm-hmm. um but often they're not so you like pull the plug as soon as it gets steep basically and you're like yeah we can walk to about here which is actually like kind of a long day because it's like 10 to 5 it's when it finally starts getting real mm-hmm. um which is like two to three hours from parking lot so but even then you're at that point you're done by like eight or nine mm-hmm. and then you rock on a.m exactly a.m yeah yeah <laughs> nice. and then you fall asleep 5 p.m yeah well like whatever i do really badly if i try and nap in the middle of the day like it just jacks up my sleep schedule and so that's like 
like the the going climbing thing is like partly because I'm obsessed with rock climbing, and partly just because like if I go outside, I can like stay awake through the day mm-hmm. and then like yeah, keep return to the normal bedtime. Yeah. Do you find that uh, like mountain guiding season is a needed rest for your rock climbing muscles? For sure. Yeah, it, that like, cycle keeps you healthier. Yeah, absolutely. Like it, it wasn't a planned thing at all. It just like worked out because it's so seasonal in nature. That I'd be like, you know, coming off the like winter mm-hmm. of sport climbing at Smith usually, and my skin is worked. My fingers are like on the edge of breaking, and then I spend like three months just walking around. I still climb, but like I tend to like do more volume, like multi pitch stuff in the mountains mm-hmm. or like. You know, just like easy, you know, somewhere I haven't been before, so I'm gonna like pick out a project and like work it to death. I wanna just like climb routes and like do stuff I can do relatively quickly. So, yeah, like I typically like structure it so like fall and winter are like my single pitch performance seasons, mm-hmm. and then summer is like just like hanging out. Though this year I'm gonna do a little different. I'm like gonna probably taper here in a month or two and then try to like train July and August. Cool. The yeah. hundred degree weather. Yeah, like, are you going out to Lander? I'll be in the Tetons, okay. um, and like it's just like a the Tetons are a pretty terrible place to go cragging, mm-hmm. and a great place to train um, cool. because the cragging's bad. So like I, that's like how training works for me is if I can't go rock climbing, then I'll train. But if I can, I'm like, yeah, I don't really care that much. What does your training look like? Just on the board, or I just do at this point like max hangs and uh, four at max pull ups. Cool. Yeah. Do you do lower body core? I don't do any lower body stuff just because I'm walking. I'm walking all the time. Uh, and I, I should do more core. I, I'm, yeah, I'm really bad at nah. core. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Rough climbing is like literally just shoulders to fingers. I feel like it's mostly it's like back. you're just going to be able to hang here, yeah. get your feet up, and go like that. Yeah. If you can put it down to your waist, you're plus one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you're doing better. Yeah. Uh, how do you stay, are there any other things you do to stay healthy, just so you can keep, keep doing this year after year? Because it's not, it's not light on your body. No, yeah, I stretch a lot. Mm. Um, I didn't for a long time, mm. and I had, like, a series of back problems mm-hmm. where it would, like, seize up. And I've never, like, gotten it, I've done a doctor or anything, but I have a lot of friends that are doctors, and they're like, yeah, we don't really do anything for backs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> those are, like, your exact words. Um, I was, like, asking Dave, I was like, if you had a lower back problem, did you go to a doctor? And he was like, nah. Yeah, exactly. So just like stretching has always like kind of like solved the problem for me. And as a result of those experiences, like I stretch. Not like religiously, but very frequently. Cool. Just yeah. like at night. Watching TV or, or like I really like doing on rest days. I remember mm-hmm. seeing some like like Steve Bechtel training plan once that was like, these are your training days and then these are your mobility days. I'm like, yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. mobility day. Not a rest day. Exactly. Like, you're still trouble. doing something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do, would you have like a top 10 stretches or do you have a routine you do? Yeah. It's like, I just kind of like fell into it. Um, it's like mostly hamstrings and glutes mm-hmm. and like low back stuff because that for me is like always what jacks up my back. Though lately I've been doing a lot more. Uh, flexors and extensors in my forearms too because those are getting cranky and old. Mm-hmm. Um, calves. Yeah. Uh, lately, I tore my ACL two years ago, as you know, and so like quad stretches became a thing for me too. Like that was oh, never yeah. really one I like had to do, but I like used a patellar graft to mm-hmm. be, be, have become my new ACL, and like part of that is trying to like maintain quad mobility. Do you think part of your ACL? Injury was lack of flexibility, or no? I was like a, a pretty committed stretcher at that point. <laughs> oh, you are. Uh, yeah. Okay. It was just a very unfortunate ski day. Yeah. How it how it happened? Yeah. Backwards, backwards, twisting fall kind of. No, I was like, like you know, skiing the run, and like the side of my ski just hit a rock under the snow, mm-hmm. and it like. So you went forward. I went. Yeah, forward and sideways over my ski. Yeah. 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 So that took a year and a half to recover from? Yeah, I mean, let's see. So I did that in the new year of 2020. Mm -hmm. And I think I started, I went to return to work, see, a year and a half in April of 2021. Yeah. Yeah. And part of that was COVID. Like most people, like they either they tear their ACL and then they like get it fixed right away. Mm -hmm. And I waited like seven months. 
Yeah. Yeah. How does that look um, from a guiding standpoint? Uh, healthcare is you know, yeah. important for a lot of people. Like, right. Is that is is guiding something you can do anywhere from injury at work? Uh, like, the, do you have workers' compensation? Right. Or like, if you have a chronic illness and you need to take medication, is there like health coverage so you can afford right. that med- medication? Right, right, right. So I get health insurance through the marketplace. Mm-hmm. Like, that was something that so strikes me. Oregon health. Uh, not Oregon insurance. health plan, but just like the Obamacare, basically. Like, okay. You know, if you don't have health insurance to your employer, which pretty much no amount, not some do, like it's starting to become a thing, but it's pretty unusual. Um, then you, you know, you're like, it's like you're a waiter or waitress because they probably don't get health insurance either unless they're working for like a big company. Are you a contractor when you work for companies? No. So okay. that's like something that's changed in the industry. And it, like basically when I started working here 10 years ago or started working 10 years ago, like <clears throat> some companies would get, would treat you as a 1099 and mm-hmm. some would treat you as a W2 employee. Mm-hmm. And there are still some that will 1099. Um, but I'm like pretty attached to being a W2 employee for the workers' compensation. Mm-hmm. So if I get hurt on the job, it's, it's yeah, like, like if you tried to put a monetary value on that, like in terms of like the, like how much I would want to be paid in order to offset that, like it would be a lot of money mm-hmm. because like just yeah. the peace of mind knowing that if I get hurt working. Maybe like thousands of ex- a thousand totally. extra dollars a month i mean that happened to go over to remind me towards acl at work and he got a paid disability they paid for his you know surgery they paid for his pt like and he couldn't go to like the surgeon he wanted to but like that's pretty huge like yeah. that, that's like Definitely. tens of thousands of dollars <laughs> do you got do you carry like spot insurance that ex- accident insurance uh i was affordable. considering it it does seem very affordable when it became a thing i was like actually in pt for my knee mm-hmm. and i was like asking my pt about it and she was like don't get that like, really? she, i guess she's seen a lot of people with it because mm-hmm. the whole deal right is like you pay them and then you can go straight to whatever provider you want and you just send the receipt to them and they'll compensate you mm-hmm. she's seen a lot of people fail to get compensation oh interesting like they like find a way mm-hmm. to it. Yeah. Which because I think there are some caveats if you have, like if if workers' comp is supposed to cover it, they won't cover it if they're right. And the one the examples she was using were is like pre-existing conditions that weren't really like uh, you know like you injured your knee twelve years ago, therefore this is just that injury mm, cropping back out. Oh, and we're not, yeah, so like it seems a little and like the like the uncertainty of it is I think is like the deal breaker for me like. Mm-hmm. If it was like clear what the rules were and what they were and we're not going to cover right. it, I would consider it. Mm-hmm. But like, you know, PT is not cheap. And if you went to like not PT cheap. for like a month, that's like some thousand amount of dollars. Mm-hmm. And like you thought you weren't going to pay that, and all of a sudden like you've got this like three thousand dollar PT bill. Right. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It it's amazing that some health coverage doesn't cover more PT because they can go so, Dude, so, so far to yeah. just make you healthier later on. Yeah, especially for like a- active people mm-hmm. like and being active is healthy. So you think you'd want to be in like the health insurance company's best interest to yeah. like you like mandatory active. PT. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've thought about like going to PT even though I don't really have any like chronic thing. Just be like, mm-hmm. what do I need to work on right now? Keep me being a good human. <laughs> right. And I have like friends that do that. Like it mm-hmm. makes a lot of sense. Yeah. It feels pretty amazing to like feel fresh and well put together and be like, I can do anything right now. Totally. My body is good. I feel like as I get older, every time I feel that way and like notice that I'm feeling good, I'm like, I'm oh, about to get in <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah, go a little harder. And, yeah, it just comes crashing down. Yeah. 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 Well, that's some, that's some good stuff. You obviously are digging being a, a climbing guide. Yeah, I, guide. I'm, like, I feel like I've got a lot of like friends and coworkers that are always talking about like their exit strategy and they have a lot of angst about it. And like, I don't have that. Like, obviously I recognize them 100% reliant on my body for work. And at some point my body will probably not allow me to do this job. And like on some level you want to plan for that. But like, I don't, I don't like, I'm not like actively trying to leave. Mm-hmm. I really like it. 
I think it's great. Do you think that there's enough growth in the industry where like as you're as you get older and your body's not able to do it, there's like administrative work within the I definitely have like where'd you do something else? Like I have friends and coworkers that have done that. Mm-hmm. Um, I would do something else. One, because I don't want to be an administrator. Mm-hmm. And two, because like like there's not that much money in mountain guiding. Right. And like yeah. those guys are working really hard and they're not getting that much in return. Like as opposed to if they're like working in tech or uh-huh. farmer or whatever, like like they're like working their asses off and they're getting, they're making like an okay salary, but like it's not one proportional to the amount of effort they're putting in and two, like um, the work they're doing kind of sucks. Yeah. So I think I'd rather it's find some great time. Yeah, exactly. Sitting at a desk, just like, you know, managing people and stuff. Some people like that. Some people love that. One, of, like, my, one of my dream jobs, <laughs> it's so ridiculous, uh, is uh, being like a, uh, Andy works for uh, Safeway or Albertsons, and they have this uh, float pharmacist pool, basically float employee pool. So mm-hmm. it's like whatever, fifty employees, and they just send them all over. Uh huh. And they seem to do such an awful job with it. I kind of want that job, like being be in charge of who goes where. Mm-hmm. Just okay. having like a battle board in the whole <laughs> area, and like who needs what, and that kind of stuff. It's kind of interesting. Totally. But I bet it's awful as well. <laughs> I mean, I just think it's kind of my point. Like, like you see that and you're like, that seems sweet. But mm-hmm. like, most of the people I know that are like, you know, get managing companies or, you know, guide managers at companies, like, they didn't get into that job because they saw that and the responsibilities and tasks inherent in that job and were like, this looks like yeah. fun. <laughs> it was just like where guiding took them. Right. And yeah. like, like that. They got promoted <laughs> out of guiding. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Or they like aged out one of what were a combination thereof. Or they like, just saw the stability. I think that's like a thing, like, you know, you're constantly working this job. Like like I could not get I could not make any money this year if all the trips fall apart. Mm-hmm. And there's like some degree of anxiety that, that produces. And I think there's like the byproduct of that is it's always very appealing to look at like those positions, like either being like a guide manager or like working in an administrative role at a guide service or like and the classic one is becoming like an outdoor, a college outdoor program manager. Like seeing the stability of mm-hmm. those positions is like very appealing. Tired and yeah, hard. yeah, exactly. And so like, what's your, what's your, if you can't use your hands and feet, what's your uh, non-climbing dream job? Baking bread. Ooh, <laughs> you go work in a bakery. Oh, you need your hands and feet. Well, it's yes, different. Though. It's different. Yeah, yeah. It, like. I, I think I could like still bake bread if I can't like yeah. do like 5,000 work feet in a day. Bread cart, pizza cart. Something like that. Yeah, I haven't figured. I think like you'd be, I don't know, you would know better. You, you actually understand how that whole industry works, but it seems like it would be cool to do like made order bakery. Mm-hmm. So like you sign up and you get a loaf of bread on Thursday or whatever. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be really important be, because you like, uh, the, that concept is really good because you, would just know how much you right. Would, you don't exactly. have like loaves of bread, or you're like that ah, crap. Exactly. exactly. That seems like the money. <laughs> <laughs> that seems like the like crux of that industry is you're always like making product and you don't know how much you're actually gonna sell. Yeah. Whereas if it was like people are like I want to loaf, you know, you just like I feel like you work really well with climbing too because you're just like you can get bread on you know Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, mm-hmm. and then those are your like baking days. Yeah. And you just figure out how much money you need. And, yeah. Okay. Yeah, like my sister lives in Portland, and she, <clears throat> a friend of theirs, has this pizza place, and like I think it's, he doesn't do it like that made to order, but he just like he's only open three days a week, and he makes sixty pizzas a day, and he like that's it, that's it. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. But then from the outside, you're like, ah, oh, man, the restaurant industry is so hard. Don't you just want to make that extra sixty pizzas <laughs> on another day? But yeah. yeah, that work-life balance can slip away real easy. Exactly. You only have such like a limited. Ah, it's such a balance. It's wild. Yeah. Totally. Um, but I remember going to when Andy, pretty much any climbing trip, uh, but specifically Andy and I were in Spain, and every day after climbing, we'd go to a bakery, get a loaf of bread, and eat it on the way home while we're <laughs> like get before dinner. Yeah. We just like eat bread, go cook dinner. Yeah. So if you had like a pickup 
like right outside of Smith <laughs> Rock or something. At that point. Yeah. That would totally. be pretty sweet, actually. Totally. That'd be easy. That'd be, that'd be rad. You could yeah. just start that now. Get that hustle. Yeah. Because they're always, Red Point's always looking for food. Right. That's true. Because they can't do it on their own. I'm surprised yeah. they haven't like put a food cart there. Uh, there's some weird regulations. regulations for the surface behind, uh, behind Red Point, like where the food cart would go. Uh -huh. They would need, they need more infrastructure than what they have. Gotcha. Yeah, it's not That's the wild, it. food cart is not the wild west anymore. Because they, they asked me, I've been asked a few times if like I'd make pre-made burritos for them or right. whatever. Yeah. Um, and they've definitely thought about doing their own thing for food, having a commissary. Right. Um, but, yeah, it gets complicated real fast. But bread. Bread's pretty simple. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you could definitely do that at home and just bring it by. And exactly. Yeah. Go in there anyway. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I don't know exactly what that would look like, but yeah, I really like making bread. Cool. Yeah. It's yeah, like delicious. I know that. That's what yeah. everybody tells me. Yeah. Uh, I think I think we dove in pretty good here. We've got Sweet. some good info on that. Awesome. Any parting words? Where can people find you if they want to? If they want you to guide them up uh, these things. <laughs> Probably the easiest way is just like on Instagram, Max Zephyr. Okay. Um, probably more more active on Mountain Project. Under the same thing. Max Zephyr on Mountain Project. <laughs> yeah. You can find me there. Cool. What should they not call you for? Uh, you mean like specific trips I don't want to do? Uh -huh. I don't really. I mean, uh, yeah. Whatever. Yeah, like there's certain trips like like I'm not gonna like Red Rocks in August. Right. Definitely not gonna climb in Vegas in August. Um, I was gonna say like I, unless someone really wants to pay for travel, mm -hmm. they shouldn't be like come climb in wherever mm -hmm. you know because I'm not there. So yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Or even like. You know, if I'm like working here, I don't want to like fly to Colorado to like right. guide some working. You're trying to like lump stuff together. Yeah, exactly. And I'm like open to like interrupting that to a certain degree, but like I don't. It, that, that's when I'm like, hey, you gotta pay for the flight, you gotta pay for the rental car, and like all this other stuff. How much of what you do in your own personal guiding is like, do you consider coaching or is it just guiding? So you, you want to see them develop or no? Like it's pretty cool. Like a lot of. The clientele I've developed lately has been, I think this is like reflective of the growth in climbing, right? Like there's more people doing it, more people wanting it and good at it. Um, and like, yeah, like a lot of my return clients, they're like pretty competent climbers and they just like want, you know, someone more competent than them. It's also like trained in these ways and, and like, you know, like last summer I was, got, he was basically a friend, he's like not a client, but like we were like climbing this, uh, a climb. Like he was trying to free uh, Inran line on Liberty mm -hmm. Bell, and okay. I was just like there playing him and like, being like, yeah, try this, try that. You know, like this is how the process works. Like you got through the pitch, don't just keep going. Like stop the anchor and like go back down and like work the moves. You know, yeah. just like, yeah, cool, yeah, awesome. Coaching is fun. Thanks for sitting down with me. For sure, we'll do it again. Yeah,